At the start of this month we hit 5,000 subscribers and I was so happy to celebrate that milestone. Not even a month later, we're now at 10,000. Your comments and support have helped me so much. Thank you everyone that keeps coming back to watch these videos. I never thought this would happen. To celebrate 10,000 subscribers, please make a friend in the comments, there's so many of you commenting every video, it's about time you got to know each other. Thank you again. Before we begin, if you think you might fall asleep, please introduce yourself in the comments, and while you're there, please like the video and subscribe if you haven't already. I'm always interested in knowing what country everyone is from, so let us know in the comments and share what time it is where you are. Thank you once more for joining me. Get cozy, grab a glass of water, turn the lights off, and make sure you've locked your door. Don't forget to say hello in the comments. It's time to close your eyes. About 13 years ago when I was 18 and had just gotten my first computer, I spent a lot of time exploring some pretty disturbing websites. It was different back then, there wasn't much stopping you from ending up on gore websites, it was quite common to be scrolling through forums and suddenly see a video of someone being beheaded or accidentally watching an execution. Admittedly, I sometimes went out of my way to watch this kind of stuff too. Morbid curiosity I guess. So. As I ventured down the rabbit hole of the dark web one night, I came across a website that claimed to be an interactive adventure. I loved interactive adventure story books and thought a digital version could be even better. Upon entering the site, I was immediately struck by its unusual format. Instead of traditional storytelling choices, it presented a series of hyper-realistic photos showcasing various choices. The story started outside what looked like an abandoned factory, you always had two choices. The first one was pretty simple, you had to choose which door to go into. One door had a no entry sign on it, and the other had a big stop sign. I chose the second one because I figured that it'd lead to the more interesting story. Each choice led to a set of photos that portrayed the consequences of your choice, for the first few clicks it was just navigating the factory. There were all sorts of tools and creepy props all over the place. It looked like a slaughterhouse with what looked like body parts of pigs or some other animal hanging on hooks. The level of realism was shocking, especially back then when the public or some cheap website wouldn't have the funding to make such realistic scenes. The next image had a picture of the woman with her hands clearly chopped off with only bleeding stumps remaining on her arms. I couldn't believe this game was free. It was so convincing. The two choices now were just save or end. I was not about to end my little journey here so I clicked save. Again, the website took a few minutes to load and I sat patiently waiting for the next part of the story. I was so numb to gore and this kind of thing after spending enough time on the internet so I wasn't particularly shocked at the bloody details, just in love with the creativity of this game. The page refreshed and it was an image of the woman again but this time her hands were bandaged and she's staring right at the camera, absolute terror in her eyes. I thought it was weird that I didn't get to make a choice, but I assumed when you save the game it kind of does a soft reset so that people who made other choices would all lead to that part anyway. I played similar games before so I knew that often, no matter which choices you make, the game will force you down the path it had planned anyway. Another choice appeared. Man or child. I was a sick little teenager, but I didn't want to see a child getting tortured, even if it was just a game, so I chose the man. A few minutes passed again and then a man appeared in the chair. This time I had the choice between a rope and a baseball bat. I chose the rope, wondering how creative they could get with something so simple. Once again, a short delay between the next image loading, and I maybe started to get a bit bored at this point, but I waited. The next page loaded. The man had the rope around his neck. He was stood on the chair and the rope was attached to a metal beam above. It was crazy how brutal this website was, but part of me loved the intensity. I'd hit another checkpoint asking to save or end. 
It was at that moment my mom knocked on my bedroom door and I panicked and quickly pressed end. The page went blank just as she walked in. This is where it got seriously creepy. I immediately felt my stomach turn and my heart drop. The picture had loaded. The man who'd been holding the camera the whole time was now looking into a mirror, dressed in some butcher overalls, covered in blood. Leaning against the mirror was the man with a broken neck, his face had some disturbingly realistic details, like his eyes bulging and his face seriously discolored. Two female hands, standing upright on their stubs, were also sitting next to the mirror, both with their thumbs up. It was incredibly morbid, but that wasn't the worst part at all. The worst part was written on the mirror. My name. My address. My mind was racing. I was completely freaking out. I even turned my screen off as if that would do anything. Was this real? Did I just determine the fates of these people? What the hell was going on? How did they have my details? I felt sick. I turned the screen back on and saw the two choices. It said, continue. With yes or no as the options. I immediately clicked no. I was done. I was genuinely so scared. The page started loading again, this time quite a lot faster than usual. The new page was just a zoomed-in image of my name and address, with the option to continue being repeated back at me, this time with save or end as the options. Is that what save meant? Save the woman? And end? Did I choose to end the man? I was drenched in sweat at this point and really panicking. Was this a threat? I have to continue or they'll come for me. Am I choosing to save myself or end myself? I hated everything about this moment. I clicked end and immediately turned the computer off. As you can tell from the fact that I'm telling this story, they never came for me. We did move house a few weeks later for unrelated reasons, so maybe that's why. But I lived in complete fear for at least three years after this. Did I really do those things? Was it just a creative game with some clever tricks? It would explain the long loading pages. I don't like to think about it. Well, at least I didn't choose the child. Have you ever Googled yourself? A few months ago I was feeling curious and decided to do it out of sheer boredom. With a fairly rare name, I wasn't expecting much in the search results. Yet to my surprise, I stumbled upon a website that had my full name as its domain. Upon clicking the link, I found myself on a message board. The website owner's profile appeared oddly familiar, sharing my age and similar hobbies. Although the message board lacked any posts, I saved it in my favorites due to the intrigue. A month later, I returned to the site. This time it boasted more content featuring diary entries that seemed ordinary at first glance. Notes like the weather was nice today or I'm so bored at work. Yet as time passed, I began noticing an array of coincidences. The owner lived in my city, which struck me as quite a coincidence given the rarity of our shared name. As I delved deeper, I found the diary's contents eerily mirroring my life experiences. One day it mentioned attending the same baseball game I had gone to. At first I dismissed it as a simple chance occurrence given the popularity of the local team. However, the coincidences persisted and became unsettlingly precise. Their pet dog's name matched mine from childhood and even their favorite restaurant was the same one I frequented during my previous job. One particular day, the message board was filled with birthday wishes for the owner. Oddly enough, it was my birthday as well. Intrigued, I decided to leave a message for the owner, mentioning our shared name and extending a birthday greeting. However, to my surprise, there was no option to type a message. It appeared the message board was merely a static page. Puzzled, I reached out to the owner via email with a simple introduction. Hi there. Believe it or not, we share the same name, birthday, and we're in the same city. Nice to meet you. Just a friendly introduction. A few days later, 
I got curious again and tried showing the website to some buddies, thinking we all have a laugh about it. But guess what? The website was gone. Completely vanished. No trace. It wasn't even in my browsing history. That didn't sit well with me. Something felt off. I mean, it's like the whole thing was there one day and then poof, it just vanished into thin air. And then I got an email from my own email address. It just said, found you. Attached was a picture and, I swear my heart stopped. It was me. Sitting at my computer. In my room. And here's the worst part. The angle of the shot was taken from the corner of my room where the window is. You have to climb the side of my house to get to this window. I zoomed in, squinting at every detail. The hairs on my neck stood up as I realized the angle of the picture didn't match up with the window. It was clearly taken from the very corner of my room where I usually keep my old chair piled with clothes. Someone had been inside. My mind raced. Who could have taken this? How did they get inside? I went through every possible explanation. A prank maybe? But the more I thought about it, the more that email in that picture made me feel like I was being watched. Stopped. I can admit I was freaked out. The whole thing went from curious to seriously messed up real quick. I can't shake the feeling that I'm being watched. Monitored. The thought of someone sneaking around in my personal space snapping a picture while I was totally unaware. It's unsettling, to say the least. I've permanently locked all of my windows now, and I've got this weird paranoia about my room. Like, am I going crazy or was someone actually in here? One night I was scrolling aimlessly through social media, clicking on random links about the dark web and supposedly true stories about crazy encounters. Boredom can drive anyone to the weirdest corners of the web, and that's how I stumbled upon this bizarre post that grabbed my attention. It was an image of my front door. The caption, back where I belong, was written below it. I'm not the superstitious type, so I rolled my eyes and chalked it up to a creative attempt at freaking someone out. The next day, I couldn't resist mentioning it to my buddies. Their reactions were a mix of amusement and speculative theories about hidden cameras and creepy stalkers. They laughed it off and I joined in. After all, we're living in the age of tech, where a few clicks can pull up someone's life story, including the color of their socks on a specific day. Probably just some algorithm, I said, dismissing the weirdness. They probably got it from my IP address and Google Maps. They chuckled, teasing me about my lack of supernatural belief. I shrugged it off. It's not like I have anyone that would want to hurt me. But as the night progressed, the sense of being watched started gnawing at me. The shadows from the window seemed to stretch a bit too far, and every creak of the floorboard sounded like a whisper. Ridiculous, right? A couple of days passed and I thought the unease had finally left me. Until an email from an unknown sender popped up in my inbox. The subject line was empty and the email had a single link. No text, just an ominous hyperlink. Curiosity and a little defiance propelled my finger to click the link. It opened a web page I'd never seen before with a weird combination of numbers and letters as its title. The screen displayed a live feed from my living room where I was sitting with my laptop. I blinked and rubbed my eyes. Completely stunned, as I saw myself from behind. Clearly there was a camera in my room, but where? Okay, now that's just messed up, I muttered, assuming it was a prank or someone playing with sophisticated tech tricks. But the camera panned around the room and my unease twisted tighter. My eyes darted around the familiar surroundings, trying to figure out where the camera was. That's why I noticed it. The angle was directly in line with the mirror that was mounted on the wall. My heart raced. I approached the mirror and tried looking at the laptop to see if my face was appearing on the live stream, but the website had turned into an error page. I spent some time trying to refresh the website and follow the link from the mail, but it was like it never existed. 
I checked the mirror again and there was no obvious signs of there being a camera. I was exhausted after a long day and I had quite a few drinks with my friends, so I told myself I was just being paranoid and went to bed. Days went by and I tried to forget the whole thing. Until one night, as I got up to grab some water in the middle of my sleep, I glanced at the mirror again. My reflection was normal, but something in the background wasn't. The edge of a shadowy figure peeped out from the corner of the mirror, a hint of a presence that shouldn't be there. I quickly turned around, heart racing, but there was nothing. The unease tightened its grip again. I need to chill out, I muttered to myself. It's all in my head. I blamed stress, lack of sleep and the power of suggestion. But when I found my favorite mug smashed to pieces on the floor of my kitchen the next morning, I couldn't stop thinking that someone had been in my house. I was a believer in facts and logic, so when I heard the kitchen door creak open the next night, I didn't jump to supernatural conclusions. I thought it was an intruder. I tried the light switch, but it didn't work. It was practically pitch black. I grabbed my baseball bat and my phone and used its flashlight to investigate. I made my way towards the living room and looked around, aiming the flashlight all over, and suddenly I spot something. The mirror was leaning against the wall and there were obvious wires hanging out of it. I felt a strange mixture of anger and fear. Someone really was messing with me and they were here right now? I shouted who the hell is in my house? And turned towards the kitchen. But as I did, the light suddenly came on and blinded me. The world seemed to blur around me. My vision blurred, and then... I woke up. I was back in my bed. I sat up, heart pounding. My bedroom was exactly the same as normal. Had it all been a dream? A really weird, vivid dream? I reached for my phone to check the time, and that's why I noticed the notification. An email had come in from an unknown sender. With trembling fingers, I opened it. It was a photograph. Almost the exact same photograph as the one that started this whole thing. It was my front door, but this time it was taken at night. The caption below the image sent shivers down my spine. Sleep well. Goodbye for now. My eyes darted around the room as if expecting someone to jump out at me. But I was alone. My logical mind tried to find a rational explanation. Maybe it was a prank, an elaborate scheme by someone with too much time on their hands. I rushed to my laptop and checked the sender's email address, but it was a jumble of letters and numbers, impossible to trace. I started to panic as I realized that this wasn't a joke. Someone was watching me, invading my privacy, and I had no idea who or why. I ran back into the living room to check the mirror. It was back on the wall in its usual place. I frantically clawed at it and ended up smashing it on the ground in an attempt to prove to myself that I wasn't crazy. I felt like I was going insane, stood barefoot on my broken mirror, shuffling through the shards with my bare hands. The camera was gone. Or it was never there. What was I doing? I locked the front door, drew the curtains and sat in the dimly lit room, my heart racing. I thought about going to the police, but what could he tell them? that I was receiving strange emails and photographs that seemed impossible to explain. The hours dragged on and as the night grew darker, I felt my paranoia settling in. I didn't want to admit it, but the rational explanations were wearing thin. Was it really possible that someone was going this far out of their way to terrorize me? As I gazed at my laptop, its webcam staring back at me, I couldn't shake the feeling that someone, or something, was watching. I closed the laptop and made my way back to bed. If they wanted to hurt me, they would have done it already, and I was exhausted from this whole ordeal. I accepted my fate and closed my eyes. Good night. Good night. Sleep tight. This happened about 20 years ago, and I don't think I will ever forget it. Back in those days, I was an apprentice hairdresser for one of the top five ranked stylists in Japan. Training in that profession at that level was very strict, and beauty standards were a bit different. 
You probably don't need me telling you that, but it's probably worth keeping in mind. Back to training, it was long, and the time off between sessions was pretty much non-existent. We were expected to be at training even during national holidays. I'm not sure if that was strictly by the books, but as impressionable young stylists, we couldn't be seen refusing training. I think I had about three or four days off for summer. I took them all at once, and a lot of my friends and co-workers used that time to head back to their hometowns and see families. Since I lived really close to where I was studying, I didn't want to use my time off just hanging around at home, I could do that any time. So, I accepted an offer from one of my seniors to visit his hometown. It was really late by the time I finished work, and we managed to get to my senior's hometown at around 2 a.m. The satellite navigation system told me that we were about 15 minutes away from arrival. The roads were dark and empty, we were the only ones on the road that late. He lived in the middle of nowhere, so that could have been a reason. I remember seeing empty fields on either side of the road. I kind of regretted coming already. I mean, what the hell were we going to do here? He should have probably mentioned that he lived in the rural countryside. I just watched the road and tried to stay awake. I should say that I was driving, I felt like driving since I didn't get to drive much. I might have changed my mind if I had known it was going to be that far to get to his family home. Then suddenly, something appeared out of the darkness in front of the car. A woman with no clothes came running down the opposite lane of the road towards us. I slammed on the brakes because I thought that I just witnessed the paranormal. She ran past us. I looked in the rearview mirror to see a woman between the ages of about 18 to 20 years old. She kept running, then she turned around and ran towards our car. I looked at my friend, and he had a look of disbelief on his face, and I guessed that I didn't have that much of a different look. I think the reality of the situation was we both didn't know what to do. I said to him, is that a ghost? I don't know, shall we just keep going, he replied. We slowly pulled away. I was very skeptical because I thought she looked so real. I made sure I kept to a low speed, and I kept checking the mirrors. The woman got closer, and I stopped the car and said to him, that's not a ghost, come on, we have to stop and see if she's okay. He agreed and said he would call out to her. It was so creepy to see someone running around in the middle of nowhere, even creepier if you haven't been to that place before. She kept on running past our car, so I tried to match her speed as my friend rolled down the window and tried to speak to her. Hey, you shouldn't be running around on the roads like that, this late at night, maybe you should head home, he said something like that. It wasn't very well put together or that sympathetic, I remember that much. She didn't even turn to face the car, she just said, Hey, don't worry, I'm fine. It feels so good. I could see her a little closer now and guessed her age to be around 18 or 19 years old. Why are you like this? Have you been kidnapped? Has someone done something to you? It's really dangerous to be out here with no clothes and alone, we have to get you home, I said to her. She stopped running and looked down at the floor as if in thought, and then replied, I ran away from home. I don't even know where home is. I noticed at that point that she was actually wearing socks and shoes so at least her feet weren't too bad. She stood there with her hands behind her back, looking completely lost and confused. It was very odd. I couldn't leave her out here. I told my friend in a hushed voice that we had to help her, and he sighed but then nodded. We decided to take her to the nearest police station. I had a dress that belonged to one of my female colleagues at work in the back of my car. Long story short, I told the woman to throw it on and she reluctantly agreed. Once she was dressed and in the back seat, I turned to her and said, Right, if you can't remember where home is, I can take you to the police and we can figure it out from there, okay? To that, she responded with something outrageous. I hate the police, they're always on my dad's side. Please, can you just take me to a hotel? Hotels are safer than police for sure. You can stay there with me. Hold me tonight, I'm a virgin. We were young, but even though we were young and often threw caution to the wind, 
we knew that we had to get her somewhere safe. It's a scary world out there. If she said that to another pair of guys like us in the next car that came along, well, I don't even want to think about it. We told her that wasn't going to happen. She didn't say anything for a while, but then she handed me a piece of paper. I don't know where she got it from, but it had a name, a number, and the address of a hospital. My friend saw the address and said, Oh, I know that place. It was a psychiatric hospital. We called the number, and a voice that said it was the security department answered. I explained to the security guard what happened, and after we hung up, we got a call from the woman's mother. We found out where her mom lived and took her there. My friend said that he knew that side of town, but he had never been there before. The woman's mother was extremely apologetic over the phone. My friend spoke to her, and he said that he could tell that she was definitely genuine and sorry for the inconvenience. I felt sorry for her, it wasn't her fault. When we got to the house, we heard more about the situation from her mother. The woman we found out in the middle of nowhere had only just turned 18. She had been assaulted by her biological father when she was 16. A few days after he did what he did, she stabbed him in the neck with a box cutter knife. She was admitted to a mental asylum because of this attack. No one seems to know how she keeps giving out but the mother said to us that this was the third time she'd successfully broken free. What a sensational story, I remember thinking. We drove the mother and daughter to the hospital at the mother's request. I could see how mentally tired she was by all of what had been going on. She was so polite and grateful, she really impressed me. I mean, with all that happened, she seemed to be incredibly in control of her own emotions. The girl didn't seem to say much, she seemed to like the dress we gave her. The mother apologized for not washing it before returning it, and we both agreed that no apology was necessary. Obviously, she got dressed into clothes of her own. She disappeared upstairs to change and then she came back, and we took off. She didn't say much when we were driving, she was taking being returned to the asylum a lot better than expected. I thought that she would be going kicking and screaming. Her mother spoke with her in the back as we drove. She said, you didn't get injured or anything when you were out, did you? No, I'm fine, the daughter responded. Oh, that's great, I'm relieved, the mother told her. We left them at the hospital and told them that we couldn't stay because we were already really late getting to my friend's parents' home. My friend's parents were really worried by the time we got there. I think that we both wanted to tell them everything about the situation, but we were too tired to go through it all again. At that point, I just wanted to go to sleep. I stayed with him and his family for three days. It was actually a really great time and just what I needed, a break from studies in the city. It was certainly going to be a trip I would never forget. We said our goodbyes to the family and his little sister asked us for a ride to the station. I said that it wouldn't be a problem. Just before we dropped her off at the station, she said something that scared the hell out of me. Hey big bro, why does your friend have a box cutter stabbed in the back seat? So, a quick backstory. I used to live in a very small town, predominantly safe for kids, with only some drug issues. My house was located in a small upscale part of the town, most people who lived there were families. A small pond with lots of greenery in the neighborhood was about a five minute walk from my house. To get to the pond, you had to go down a grass hill. Neighborhood kids, including myself, would always go down to the pond for hours to catch frogs, skip rocks, and enjoy nature. Now, on to the story. On this particular day, it was rainy and pretty cold, so there were no other kids at the pond. My best friend, her brother, who was one year older than us, and myself, decided to head down to the pond for a bit. After about half an hour, we saw a minivan pull up at the top of the hill. We thought nothing of it, assuming it was probably someone stopping at the neighborhood mailbox. A man, probably in his sixties, got out. In our small town, everyone knew everyone, or at least recognized each other. 
I found it strange that I had never seen this man before in town or the neighborhood. He just stared at the three of us for what seemed like forever. Suddenly, he yelled at us, saying, It's not safe down there, you kids better come up here. My best friend and her brother looked terrified, and I had this gut feeling that something wasn't right. We didn't respond, but he kept repeating that phrase. It's not safe down there. You kids better come up here. Our fight or flight reaction kicked in, and we all sprinted up the other side of the hill, just a few meters away from him and the minivan. As soon as he saw us running, he got into his minivan and started driving slowly behind us, literally following us until we reached my house. Fortunately, my garage door was open and my parents' cars were parked inside. We hid behind one of my parents' cars and watched as he pulled to the side of my house and parked. My parents were inside, unaware of what was happening. He stayed parked in front of my house for a couple of minutes until my dad came outside to take out the trash and saw the three of us hiding. I guess the man saw my dad and drove away, but as soon as he left, we told my parents everything. Even now, 12 years later, my parents still think we were being overdramatic and that the man was genuinely concerned for our safety because of the weather. Nonetheless, we weren't allowed to go back to the pond anymore. I understand why they think this, the three of us tended to exaggerate things and be dramatic. However, I knew from the strange feeling I had when I first saw him at the top of the hill that something was off. To this day, I still believe he was planning something, but maybe it was just my childish imagination. I used to work in a hole-in-the-wall gas station in the sticks of North Carolina. I was freshly 18, had a new car, a rundown Chevy, but it got me from point A to point B, and was newly promoted to assistant manager, so I was working many late nights by myself. Truthfully, I loved working alone. My boss was super laid back, and his philosophy was, as long as the work gets done, do whatever you please. We even had a shotgun behind the counter, which he taught me to shoot on my first day there. So even though I would be there late, I always felt safe. On this particular night, it was extremely dead, so with my boss's permission, I closed the store early and hopped in my car. It was probably 11.30 to 12 a.m. at this point. Other than being able to get out of work early, this was my usual routine. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. I texted my roommate to let her know I was getting home early, we always looked out for each other like that, lit up a cigarette, and then started on my way home. For those of you who don't know North Carolina very well, I'm going to provide a little bit of detail regarding the terrain. From where I worked at the gas station to where I lived, I had to drive down the back roads. These roads consisted of very dense woods on both sides. Sometimes, the woods would seem so thick that you really couldn't tell where you were. Especially at night. This could be intimidating to those who don't know the area, but honestly, I was more worried about deer jumping out in front of me, which was a common occurrence in this area. I'm driving down the road, blaring Nirvana, my favorite band at the time, and just being a typical 18-year-old grunge kid who had newly discovered the freedom of being an adult and getting off work. When all of a sudden, I see something in the middle of the road, probably 75 to 100 feet ahead. At first, I thought it was a deer, but it looked too small. So I started to gradually slow down, ultimately coming to a stop. I have to wear glasses when I drive. I mainly need them at night, but my eyesight isn't terrible enough for me to make it a habit. I grab my glasses and put them on. Now being able to see much more clearly, I almost shat myself at what I saw. It was a woman. An older woman wearing what looked like a nightgown of some kind. Her hair was in disarray, she had her hands behind her back, and she was just standing there, in the middle of the road, just staring at me in my car. Let me remind you, we are practically in the middle of nowhere. There are trees as far as my headlights can shine, and it's midnight. I'm naturally paranoid, so all sorts of questions were running through my head. Who is this woman? Where did she come from? It's midnight. Are my doors locked? 
Why is she out here at midnight? Should I honk my horn at her? Should I call the police? What if she has Alzheimer's and doesn't know where she is? Or what if she's an escape patient? Even though the closest mental facility was three to four cities away, I didn't exclude that possibility. I thought about calling the cops, but I got my phone and of course, there was no cell service. This encounter went on for a while, just sitting in the middle of the road, mentally questioning what was happening. It's now way past midnight, she's still standing there, just staring at me with this zoned out look, hands behind her back as if she's observing me. I'm starting to get tired of this, considering that I had to be up early for work the next morning. So I honked my horn at her. I didn't expect what happened next. This woman's face turns from being spaced out to complete rage. And she raised her arms up. It looked like she was holding something in her hand. She lets out this horrid animalistic scream and charges at my car. As she ran closer, I realized she was holding something sharp. It looked like a kitchen knife or a piece of jagged glass. During this moment of horror, I had a brief flashback to my stepdad giving me advice when I first got my license. If an animal ever runs out in front of you, turn it into a speed bump. I love animals, so I couldn't bear to hear that. But this time, I was taking my stepdad's advice. I was going to turn this psycho into a speed bump. Surf the Servants, by Nirvana, started playing on the radio. I mention this because the song has much to do with the aura of the moment. As if it was in sync with this instance in time, the intensity of the song enabled me to let out the most intimidating primal scream that I could. Loud enough for her to hear it. The window was open because I had been smoking, and I hit the gas. She was running towards my car like she was going to jump on my hood. I guess she realized I had the utmost intent to hit her, in which at this point, the woman zigzags away from my car and runs off into the woods. Still in fight mode, I didn't question where this woman went. I was just glad that she was gone, so I accelerated on the gas and sped the entire way home. I got home at almost 1.30 a.m. My roommate was still awake, waiting up for me the entire time. She was extremely worried because it was way past the time I said I was going to be home. She had been texting and calling me when I pulled up to her house. I got all of her texts and missed calls at once, so I started to explain to her what happened. My body went from fight mode to panic as I was recounting everything that happened. My roommate's mother was a 911 operator who also happened to be working that night. So she decided to text her mom to see if there were any silver alerts in the area. Immediately, her mom texted back and said there wasn't. That alone gave me goosebumps to the core of my being. There was no explanation as to where this lady came from. I used to work in a residential care facility, and for a number of years, I worked with a woman named Kajiri. She was generally okay to work with, but she could be intense. The sort of joking flirtation that often found its way into high-pressure environments was common throughout the whole team, but when she directed it at me, it didn't seem so jokey. It took me forever to realize, because I usually didn't notice someone flirting with me until someone else pointed it out six months later. But when she started trying to give me jewelry and chocolate bouquets, I finally started to pick up on it. In between things being normal and actually maybe not really normal, there was a long escalation of text messages, comments that made me uncomfortable, personal space violations, dropping by my house uninvited, hanging around on my shift hours after hers had finished, unwanted touching, etc. As mentioned, I can be slow to catch on. Once I realized what was happening, I put as much distance between us as possible. I stopped answering calls and texts, locked down social media, spoke to other colleagues and had them running interference. A lot of interference, actually. At the time, it kind of became a joke, but looking back, it was all kinds of messed up. She even parked outside my house sometimes, and I'd sit in the back room with the light off so she'd think I wasn't home. After a couple of months of my disappearing woman act, she seemed to get the hint and backed right off. I was pleased. 
we all got on with our lives and lived happily ever after. Yeah, not quite. A few months after it died down, I heard through the grapevine that Kajiri seemed to have focused her attentions on another co-worker Linda. Linda and I had a close mutual friend, but didn't know each other well. I didn't think much other than good luck, you poor sucker. A few months later again, and I got a call out of the blue from a mutual friend. Without preamble, he asked, were you dating Kajiri? Um, no, I don't swing that way. I was shocked. He had been privy to all the awkward details of my experience with Kajiri and had helped run interference. He explained that he had been talking to Linda and she asked about my relationship with Kajiri. The story that followed still sounds too fantastical to have actually happened in an actual sensible grown-up workplace. Kajiri had been catfishing her own best friend Amanda, posing as Linda. In a string of emails, fake Linda and Amanda had discussed Kajiri's drug problem, her abusive and dangerous ex, none other than yours truly. There was a story about fake Linda coming out to her family after her brother caught her in bed with Kajiri, and more. The jig was up when Linda got a second job, coincidentally with Amanda's husband, who mentioned how great it was to finally meet Kajiri's girlfriend. Which was a complete shock to Linda when she learned about herself, that she was no longer a straight woman and had a girlfriend. So essentially, Kajiri moved on from me, found a new target, started emailing Amanda from a fake account, pretending to be Linda. She told all these stories about being with Kajiri, about how I was an abusive ex, and how Linda was caught by her family being with a woman and all the drama that it caused. She made up a bunch of insane stories to justify her creepy obsessive fantasies and was telling them to Amanda and other people from a fake email to make it sound like the stories were from the fake girlfriend and Kajiri couldn't be accused of making it up. Here's some highlights of the stories Kajiri had been telling to Linda, her friends, and other co-workers I wasn't close to, she picked her audience very carefully. That Linda and I had physically fought, at work, over Kajiri. That I had an orgy in the staff office on a night shift with Kajiri and two male co-workers. That Kajiri and I had broken up after I cheated on her with another male co-worker, not one of the orgy ones, I was really getting around apparently that I would drug her against her will. That we had planned to have children using a sperm donor, but that I couldn't decide who would have the baby. This woman had been living out a full-on soap opera and using her co-workers and friends as characters. Linda and I reported her to management and she was immediately suspended, pending investigation. She quit two days later. Unfortunately, HR decided they needed to continue their investigation of the allegation that I had an orgy at work. Because that was totally plausible and not at all made up by a crazy woman. They put me through hell investigating this imaginary story about me and two men and another woman. Even though the only men in our department are twice my age and happily married. It made me never want to trust HR again. I left that job a month later myself and when I interviewed for my current job, she had interviewed half an hour before me. And they were looking to hire two people. She didn't get the job, but there have been two other openings since, and she applied for both of them. I'm terrified of meeting her again. It turned out she has a history of inpatient psych treatment for delusional behavior and was known to be obsessive about people she took a liking to. According to Facebook, her current girlfriend has a similar first name as me and shares more than a few physical similarities. She still knows where I live. So I'm pretty sure that the current situation is that she's still telling people that I'm her girlfriend, all while she's desperately applying for any job she can get at my new workplace. Okay, so I wasn't conventionally, nor classically pretty. I was the duff in any friend group I found myself in. I never worried about being hit on, disrespected, or kidnapped. Safety concerns were never an issue for me when going out because I was never the one anyone wanted to get to know or be around, I was just too plain. It was always me who had to look out for my friends, male and female alike. I used to go to a local bar almost daily. I didn't drink alcohol there. I just ordered a regular coke and waited for my ride home. It was my usual hangout spot after work, 
so I sat, chilled, and minded my own business. A few weeks ago, I had just finished work and was sitting in my regular spot, sipping my drink while working on a new pendant I was making. I had started wire wrapping crystals into jewelry. I didn't expect anyone to strike up a conversation with me, knowing I basically blended into the walls, despite the staff knowing me and paying me slight attention and being nice to me. But this weird guy I'd never seen before came over and sat at my table across from me. I was surprised and engaged in a small conversation that I can't even remember how I started, but he began asking me a few questions about myself that seemed normal and flowed together, so I didn't think much of it. Again, being plain, I didn't think anyone would take interest in me. By then, I had drunk three glasses of soda and needed to use the restroom, so I grabbed my phone and purse and went. When I returned a few minutes later, I resumed working since none of my stuff had been touched. I called a waitress over, asked for a new drink, and she nodded. It had always been engraved in me that you never leave your drink unattended. If you do, either have it remade or leave it to the bartender. As the waitress was reaching for my old drink, which only had a few sips taken out of it, the guy got a bit agitated, saying I was being wasteful for ordering a new drink. I looked at him, eyebrows raised in confusion, and asked why it was his concern. It was my money after all, and refills were free. He then accused me of making more work for the waitress for no reason. Annoyed, I told him firmly that it was my business and if he didn't like it, he could leave. He attempted to wave off the waitress changing my drink, but I had enough of his nonsense and flatly said, you drink it, if you think it's such a waste. It seemed to catch him off guard. He looked shocked, then a bit angry, before storming off. I then handed the drink to the waitress, expressing unease about the guy I was talking to, and asked her to inform the bartender to keep an eye on him. I requested to have my drink dumped out and only water served from then on. I left for home after being picked up shortly after, and the next day after work, I found out he had been arrested for assault. I only found out today what exactly had happened. Apparently, he had gotten into a fight with the bartender working that night. The bartender caught him tampering with the girl's drink while she wasn't looking and prevented her from drinking it. The guy got angry, leading to a physical altercation. The cops were called, and now he's awaiting trial. It turns out he was trying to see if he could take advantage of someone like me, someone who always let her guard down due to low confidence. He thought I'd be an easy target with just a little attention. When I didn't consume my drink upon returning, he targeted another girl. If he truly was targeting me, I had to question his sanity and sobriety. I have an unforgettable memory of when our school went into lockdown. I remember it perfectly. It was the end of 7th grade. It was a crisp Tuesday morning, we were in math class. This classroom had one entrance in the corner of the room and all the windows were on the opposite wall from that door. There were no windows facing the hallway. Our teacher, Mr. Anderson, was in the middle of explaining algebraic equations when the loudspeaker crackled to life. Principal Johnson's voice echoed through the classroom, ordering an immediate lockdown. The classroom plunged into darkness as Mr. Anderson snapped off the lights. Panic rippled through my classmates. We shuffled towards the corner, trying to remain quiet while some of us were getting emotional. We'd only practiced this once before, so we were quite disorganized and our teacher had to keep quietly reminding us to hide in the corner behind our desks. My desk neighbor Sarah started crying and asking me what was happening. I shrugged and told her I wasn't sure. I remember my heart pounding against my ribcage. Minutes felt like hours. We huddled together, anxiously waiting for any information. The classroom windows were veiled with heavy curtains, so we couldn't see outside. Mr. Anderson maintained his composure, but I could sense his fear. It had been a while since we'd heard anything, and nobody had a phone back then, so we were completely in the dark. As our teacher approached the door to listen, a loud crash echoed through the corridor, causing everyone to freeze on the spot. The sudden deafening noise was followed by a series of sharp bangs, as if something were violently striking the classroom doors. Fear swept through us like wildfire 
and my heart pounded in my chest. Our teacher's face went pale. Even in the dark I could see his face from the little bit of light that peeked through the side of the door. The banging on the doors continued, growing louder and more relentless with each passing moment. It was so intense that I could feel the walls vibrating each time. The intercom was painfully silent. Our imaginations ran wild, conjuring up all sorts of scenarios. Was there an intruder in the school? A dangerous criminal? A student going on a rampage? Out of nowhere there were screams from down the hallway. The screaming intensified as we could hear repeated banging on the doors and the sounds of windows being smashed. The sound was full of panic and we couldn't fathom what was happening outside. Time stretched on, the banging or screaming showing no sign of stopping. The sound of heavy footsteps echoed through the corridor. I held my breath and my eyes darted towards the classroom door. All I heard was a barrage of shouting men. Some giving direct orders, others seemingly just shouting as loud as possible. It was like a battle cry. Just a bunch of men roaring like animals. The noise was only amplified by the echoing hallway. The banging and screaming stopped, and a few minutes later we noticed a shadow at the door. The doorknob slowly turned, and it creaked open. My pulse quickened as I braced for the worst. Shadows danced at the entrance, and we all stared wide-eyed at the intruder. But what stepped into our classroom wasn't a menacing figure, it was Mr. Thompson, the school's custodian. Relief washed over us as we realized we were safe. Mr. Thompson calmed us all down before explaining that a bear had wandered onto the school grounds. The culprit behind our traumatizing experience was a large frightened bear. It had let itself in through one of the doors to the yard and then panicked when it closed behind it. The staff were trying to open the door again and coach it out from the outside, but their attempts just pushed it deeper into the school and it started to panic. That's why it was attacking the doors and ended up causing so much chaos. As we exited the lockdown, our adrenaline was still pumping. But now it was mixed with an overwhelming feeling of relief. That visit from a bear was something we'd remember for the rest of our lives. My middle school was once on lockdown, and I was actually somewhat a part of it. When our bus pulled up to the school, the doors opened and our principal and a few police got on the bus. There were police cars around the parking lot, and my principal pointed at four of us and told us to get off the bus and go with them. We headed to the school and then into the principal's office. We sat down in there and then he asked us, Why do you guys think you are here today? One of the kids in there, I wouldn't really call him my friend, just someone I talked to with at school, replied. Mr. Principal, I heard someone was bringing a gun into school today. The principal looks directly into my eyes with a seriously fear-inducing stare. He says, yes. And I heard this person was bringing the gun in for you. When he said, this person, it was clear he was hinting at me. And considering I had nothing to do with this, I thought this was hilarious but also terrifying. Damn you could have heard a pen drop in the room with that silence. They'd already taken our bags off us for a search and we had cops stood behind us, staring at us the whole time. The first guy, the one who had said he heard someone was bringing a gun in, finally decided to come clean. He just said, you've got the wrong Michael. They'd already checked our bags and at this point they started to pat us down. They saw that I clearly didn't have a gun, so the principal told me and my other friend to sit out in the lobby. While we were waiting in the hallway, we saw the officers following one of the teachers down towards the classrooms. Then our principal announced over the intercom that we were in lockdown. The kid they went looking for, his name was Michael, which is also my name. He brought a gun into school that day for the other guy in the office. The school said the gun was unloaded, but I don't know if I believe that. From what I heard, the gun was going to be given to the other kid because there was supposed to be a fight after school that day and he wanted a way to protect himself if things got out of hand. The reason I was taken into the office with them is since the kid who brought the gun in was named Michael, they assumed that it was me. 
It kind of bothered me that I was searched by the police and treated like a criminal because they hadn't bothered to check which Michael might be more likely to bring a gun in. I was a super quiet teenager, never got into any trouble, and the other Michael was always in detention, would get into fights constantly, literally already had an incident with a gun in the past, and yet they heard the name Michael and assumed it would be me. I didn't even get an apology. Just sent back to my class once lockdown was over. My school was a place where not much ever really happened. But one sunny afternoon, things got real weird. School was the same old routine, teachers doing their teaching, and the students just trying to keep our eyes open. I was in Mrs. Patterson's class when we started hearing whispers. The rumors going around were that there had been some strange sightings outside. One girl said that she was followed as she came in late, another guy said he saw someone trying to climb the side of the school. Outside, it was a typical blue sky day, but with what we all been hearing, the bright summer's day managed to have an element of creepiness to it. The hallways were typically silent during class, but that day I heard at least a few times some hurried footsteps and teachers shouting out of their class, occasionally reminding the noisemakers that they should be silent. Recess came, but it felt different. No laughter, no shouting, just a strange quiet. We all stared at the trees around the schoolyard, wondering what the heck was up. Something wasn't right, but none of us wanted to come right out and say it. As the day wore on, the rumors got wilder. Some kids claimed they'd seen a guy lurking behind the trees, looking all scruffy and stumbling around. Others swore they heard mumbling coming from inside the school. Mrs. Patterson tried to reassure us, saying it was probably just our imaginations or maybe some lost hiker. But as the afternoon rolled along, we were all getting jumpy. Those odd sounds outside were getting louder, and people in the class were starting to lose it. Finally, Principal Mr. O'Connor made an announcement that we had to go into lockdown. Fear ran through the school as teachers rushed us back to our classrooms. We sat there in silence, waiting and wondering what the heck was happening. Minutes ticked by, each one filled with those strange sounds outside. Then, we heard police sirens. We all listened closely, hearts pounding in our chests. A loud bang echoed through the hallway, making all of us jump in our seats. Someone was pounding on the classroom door next to us, their fists hitting it with a force that made the walls creak. The screams of terror down the hallway grew louder. Mr. O'Connor showed up at our classroom door, beads of sweat on his forehead. He looked like he'd just dodged a bullet. Stay here, he said, his voice shaking. The police are here, and they'll sort everything out. There was a bunch of commotion outside the classroom, further down the hallway. Police were shouting at a guy to get down and show his hands. We could hear the guy shouting back at them, slurring his speech and saying something about not leaving until he gets her. Eventually we saw him being dragged out in handcuffs. The teachers found it impossible to calm us down at that point. Parents were coming into school to collect their children, and teachers had given up trying to teach anything. It turns out he was the father of a girl in another class. He had a big fallout with her mother and gotten drunk or high and came to pick up his girl after the mother threatened to never let him see her again. In the end the whole thing was just sad rather than scary, but at the time it was the scariest thing that had ever happened to most of us. I used to work on the dark web. I won't get into how I came into this line of work. My job simply consisted of tracking down people I was paid to find, kidnapping them, and bringing them to a specific location. I never concerned myself with what would happen to those people afterwards, but from what I understood, they'd usually be put into the slave trade or held for ransom. After years of doing this kind of work, I eventually became desensitized to it. To me, it was just another day at the office. The only difference was that this paid much better. I should also point out that I didn't work alone. I had a partner that helped me. For the sake of this story, I'll call him Sam. Sam and I met through the dark web forums about three months after I started my work. 
He was much more experienced in kidnapping people from the dark web than me, having done it for several years. But as he was getting older, he realized the job was too difficult to do on his own anymore. After talking for a while, we eventually agreed to work together. I would help him perform the tasks that were more difficult for him to do due to his age, and he would guide me along, as well as bring me along on more difficult, higher paying jobs, to reduce the risk of me screwing them up. After meeting, we quickly realized we were a good match. It only took a few weeks to get into a groove. We'd be contacted by our employers via the forums, given a target, as well as any other important information that would be crucial for the task. Sam and I would then drive his van to the location to scope it out. We'd spend whatever time we had getting any information our employer left out, such as schedules and patterns. Then, we would decide on a date, time, and location, then secure our target and bring them to a specified drop point given to us by our employer. We'd be paid, then move on to the next job. We did our job like clockwork. As horrible of a job as it was, we were really good at it. We eventually got to the point where we could secure a target within a matter of days. We soon were able to live comfortably. Of course, we weren't stupid enough to grow complacent. After all, the dark web is a dangerous place for anyone who isn't careful. We were living smoothly, not really caring about the people we were hurting to do so. All we cared about was our fat wallets and nice homes. But then one day, everything came crashing down around us. Sam and I had been sent a job by an unnamed employer. They had instructed us to secure a 19-year-old male who lived in a wealthy neighborhood. This wasn't very abnormal for us. Plenty of previous employers sent us to secure wealthy targets, usually to ransom off. What was abnormal were the set of instructions they had given us. They told us that the target had no security system in his home, but we were not to take this for granted. We were to practice extreme caution and vigilance when securing the target, and we were to consider him extremely dangerous. Finally, the strangest instruction they gave us was that we were to administer carfentanil or a similar drug via tranquilizer darts before securing. It wasn't the fact that our employer wanted us to tranquilize our target that was strange. We had done it to plenty of previous targets before. What was strange was that they specifically requested we use carfentanil. That was the type of tranquilizer they used on elephants. Even a single dart of this stuff would be enough to kill a human. Let me make it clear that we were not hitmen. Sam and I have never killed anyone in our lives before or after taking on this line of work. We knew there was no way we could use this stuff to take our target alive. We just assumed our employer didn't really know much about tranquilizers and just wanted to sound smart by including a specific kind. I really wish we had just listened to their instructions. We started studying our target the day after we received our instructions. The boy was a recluse to say the least. From what we could tell, he lived in his parents' house, and they were almost never home. He spent pretty much every day inside, doing whatever he wanted to pass the time. Reading, playing video games, typical teenager stuff. For the life of us, Sam and I couldn't find a single reason to consider this kid intimidating, let alone dangerous. He seemed to live an extremely sheltered life and had more than likely never had a fight before. But we had a job and we had to follow the rules we were given. On the night we went to extract, we parked our van just outside the kid's home. Nobody else in the neighborhood was awake, so it would be relatively simple to pull him out once we got him. Sam sat up front, while I laid in the back of the van, aiming the tranquilizer rifle through the back doors. The way the van was parked gave me a perfect vantage point to the guy's house. Also, in case you're wondering, I wasn't using carfentanil, opting to use a weaker drug that wouldn't kill a human being. I wasn't concerned about our employer being upset their instructions weren't followed exactly. Unless they were planning on testing the kid's blood when they got him, there wasn't any way they would know. After 30 minutes of waiting, the kid appeared in the kitchen window. 
We weren't too far away, so the amount of detail I could see through was very high. He had a mop of wavy blonde hair, a splash of freckles on his nose and cheeks, and piercing emerald green eyes. He was pouring himself a glass of water when I tagged him. His reaction was surprisingly tame. He jumped from surprise as the dart entered his neck, but he didn't scream. When he pulled it out, he didn't look scared or confused. If anything, he only looked annoyed, as if he had just swatted a mosquito that had landed on him. Then he turned his head and looked right at me. I had been doing this job for about four years at this point, and I had seen some freaky shit. Sure, most of it was while I was browsing the dark web, but nevertheless, there was almost nothing that scared me. The look this kid gave me freaked me out. It's hard to describe exactly what his expression was as his eyes burned into me, but the best way I could describe it was an expression that said, I dare you to come for me. You won't like what'll happen if you do. After that, the kid turned off the kitchen light and walked out of view. The van shook as Sam opened the door and hopped out, walking around to me. He had a body bag in one hand and a flashlight in the other. All right, partner. You ready to do this? He said calmly. I don't know if he saw the kid's expression or not, but if he did, he wasn't showing it. Uh, yeah, let's go, I said, packing away the rifle and grabbing my own flashlight. Christ, this is a nice house, Sam said absentmindedly, this is one lucky kid. I know it's not what we normally do, but maybe we could rob the place while we're here. I didn't respond as we walked towards the house. I picked the lock to the back door, and we stepped in quietly. All the lights were off, and the place was dead silent. First, we went to the kitchen. We both knew the kid probably wouldn't be there. Tranquilizers take a while to kick in, and if he had walked away after getting tagged, he'd probably be somewhere else in the house. We were right. The kitchen was empty, without any dishes or food on the counters, save for the half-full glass of water. We continued searching the house, but it became quickly apparent that something was wrong. No matter how hard we looked, we couldn't find the kid anywhere. He should have fallen unconscious by now, the tranquilizer having long since taken effect. But he was nowhere to be seen. Are you sure you hit him? Sam hissed at me after several minutes of fruitless searching. I swear if you screw up this job because of crappy aim I'm gonna kill you. I know I hit him, I snapped, I even saw him pull the dart out. He couldn't have gotten far, not with that tranquilizer in him. Our argument was cut short by a noise coming from the other side of the house. It sounded like multiple thuds in quick succession, like someone was loudly stomping around. The noise continued for a minute, moving around the house, before finally stopping. Sam and I quickly split up to investigate. We weren't sure about where the noise was coming from, and we didn't want to risk our target getting away. I walked back through the kitchen to the living room. I was about to move on to the next room when something caught my eye. On the floor was a pile of fabric. When I looked closer, I found that it was a pile of clothes. I recognized it as the clothes the kid was wearing. By the looks of it, he had stripped completely naked and left his clothes here. I had no idea why he did this. Stripping naked didn't really give you a tactical advantage when trying to escape a kidnapping, at least, not one that I could think of. Taking off your shoes could make your footsteps quieter, but taking off all your clothes wasn't really necessary. I was trying to think of a good reason for the kid stripping when my thoughts were interrupted by a blood-curdling scream coming from the other end of the house. I instantly recognized the voice as Sam's. I ran as fast as I could to where the scream came from. When I got there, Sam was laying on the ground in the hallway. From where I was standing, I couldn't see any more than his upper torso, arms, and head. He was clinging to the wall for dear life while something in the hallway that I couldn't see pulled and wrenched at his legs. Whatever it was, it was strong and determined to pull Sam loose. I bolted forward, 
desperately trying to help my partner get free. I didn't even make it halfway before Sam lost his grip and was pulled out of sight. He was screaming and crying, begging me to save him. When I rounded the corner, whatever had him was pulling him through the basement door. I only saw Sam for a split second before he was pulled down the stairs to the basement. I ran to the door, flicking the light switch on. Nothing happened. Someone had shut off the power to the house. I was caught between praying that this thing was alone and praying that it wasn't. If it was alone, that meant that we wouldn't have to deal with anybody or anything else. But that would also mean that it was smart enough to know to shut off the power in order to get the upper hand. I was shaken from my thoughts by the realization that Sam had stopped screaming. I seriously considered making a break for it and leaving him behind. It was easy to assume he was dead. But even horrible people can make friends, and as much as I wanted to deny it, I had formed a bond with Sam over the years working with him. I couldn't bring myself to leave him behind. So, scolding myself for being stupid, I made my way down the stairs. When I got to the bottom, I expected the basement to be silent. Instead, I heard a distinct crunching noise coming from the other end of the room. I tried to discern what the noise was by sound alone, but the adrenaline pumping through me made it hard to focus. With trembling hands, I clicked on my flashlight and aimed it towards the noise. I spent every day wishing I had never done that. A gangly creature was hanging from an exposed bar from the ceiling of the basement. It appeared human, but only barely. Its arms were too long, with nails like claws. Its legs and feet had too many joints, which allowed it to hang upside down from the ceiling like a bat. It seemed to have skin that didn't fit its own skeleton, with some areas being stretched thin while others were bunched up. As for the crunching noise, I found out quickly where it came from. Sam was hanging from the creature's grip. He was clearly dead, with large chunks of his flesh missing. Every few moments, the creature would pull Sam's body up towards its mouth and take a large bite out of him, tearing the flesh away and chewing loudly. It didn't seem to be picky either. It ate whatever part its mouth found, including bone. Once it realized it had a flashlight train on it, it stopped eating Sam's corpse and looked up at me. Its face was a bloody mess, the features of its face were twisted horribly. Its jaw was so wide open, I thought it was disconnected from its skull and its eyes lacked any sense of humanity. This thing was a monster and I knew it would kill me without hesitation if it got the chance. I was frozen by fear, staring at this thing, when recognition suddenly struck me. The monster had horrifying features, but the blonde hair, freckles, and green eyes made everything fall into place. This thing was our target. It was the kid we had been sent here to capture. His features may have been mangled and warped, but there was no denying that this monstrosity was the kid. I understood why the tranquilizer didn't work and why our employer instructed us to use the drugs they wanted. Why they would want this thing alive is beyond me. I would sleep much better at night if I knew this thing was in a deep grave. After what seemed like hours of staring at each other, the monster screeched at me. That was enough to send me sprinting up the stairs. I didn't stop running, didn't turn around to see if the thing was chasing me. I kept running until I got to the van, jumped in the driver's seat, and peeled off into the street. I went several miles over the speed limit, but I didn't care. I wouldn't feel safe until I was miles away from that beast. After skipping town, I emptied my savings accounts and liquidized everything I owned. After that, I went through an extensive process to erase any lingering trails. I changed my name, underwent plastic surgery, and whatever little presents I had on the web I thoroughly scrubbed clean. Any evidence of the man I was before was completely gone by the time I finished. As far as anyone was concerned, I never existed until two months ago. I had made a promise to myself never to bring up what I saw, to bury the past as deep as it would go. But I have been plagued by nightmares ever since seeing that monster, 
and I thought that maybe if I warned the world of its existence, my conscience might be alleviated. I can't go into detail about where this beast is located. It's better for everyone if that is kept a secret. As for whoever it was that wanted to capture the beast, I haven't heard from them since. In all honesty, I'm actually glad we didn't succeed in capturing it. I don't want to find out what their plans for the monster were when they got it. So, take this as a warning. People say that the dark web is full of monsters. I learned the hard way that sometimes, that could be taken literally. When I left home to attend university in the UK, I knew I was in for a big change. I moved quite far away from family and friends, leaving behind the familiar comforts of home. Always a social person, this new environment was a challenge for me. My student studio apartment felt empty, and my course had fewer sociable students than I'd expected. Desperate to make friends, I turned to Tinder and Instagram, hoping to connect with like-minded people. However, luck wasn't on my side. Conversations often fizzled out, and it felt like a struggle to find genuine connections. Then, out of nowhere, a ray of hope emerged. A cute girl, Emily, added me on Instagram. I'd linked my Instagram handle in my Tinder bio, and she must have seen it there. She was stunning, and I couldn't believe my luck. We started chatting, and it seemed like we hit it off. She mentioned wanting to meet up, and without much thought, I gave her my address. The excitement of potentially making a new friend overshadowed any reservations I might have had. However, as we continued chatting, something didn't quite add up. Emily's Instagram photos didn't seem to be taken anywhere near the city I was in. Moreover, she was far too attractive to be interested in a guy like me. I noticed that her comments and followers were predominantly men. Doubt crept in, and I began to suspect that I'd given my details to a random catfish account. My anxiety peaked, and I decided to block her immediately. It was the only sensible thing to do. I hoped I'd dodged a potential scam. But then, things took an even more unsettling turn. Another strikingly attractive girl, Sarah, began messaging me. The conversation started precisely where I'd left off with Emily, as if it had never stopped. Alarm bells rang in my head, and I knew I'd messed up. They had my personal details, including my address. With a heavy heart, I asked Sarah to leave me alone and blocked her as well. But it didn't stop there. Soon after, yet another attractive girl sent me a friend request. By this point, I was fed up. I stopped replying, thinking it best to protect myself. I double-checked that my studio apartment door was locked and went to bed, hoping for a peaceful night's sleep. However, my rest was short-lived. In the dead of night, I heard someone trying to force their way into my room, shouting my name. Panic surged through me, but I couldn't move. Sleep paralysis gripped me, rendering me helpless. I'd experienced sleep paralysis almost every night since being at my new studio, it always happened while I was someplace new, but I never saw or heard anything. The door eventually creaked open, and a strange man entered my room. He rifled through my belongings as I lay there, unable to stop him. My heart raced, and my mind raced even faster, trying to comprehend the whole thing. After what felt like an eternity, the intruder left, shutting the door behind him. My sleep paralysis gradually released its grip, and I awoke in a cold sweat, scanning my room for signs of the intrusion. Everything appeared normal, and I couldn't be sure if anyone had actually broken in. I reported the incident to university security, but they found no evidence of a break-in. I genuinely didn't know if I'd imagined the whole thing. The next chilling discovery was that both the accounts, Emily's and Sarah's, had disappeared entirely. It felt so real, there was absolutely a man in my room going through my stuff. I saw it with my own eyes. I've had sleep paralysis many times and I was always able to accurately recount what was going on around me, so why would I be wrong this time? I removed my Instagram from my Tinder bio and made sure to barricade my door every night. 
My social life was pretty much dead for the rest of the year and I didn't sleep well at all. I used to be an avid Twitter user. It used to be my go-to app for wasting time, scrolling through tweets, and catching up on the latest memes. Over time, I had grown somewhat immune to the occasional creepy direct message. I had learned to ignore them, to just brush them off as part of the experience. One evening, I received a notification about a new follower. It was a name I didn't recognize, and the profile picture was a little blurry, but nothing immediately sent alarm bells ringing. I followed the account back as I usually would and immediately received a message. I decided to open it, even though I was sure it was spam. Inside the DM was a link to another Twitter profile, Secret Tweets. My curiosity got the better of me, and I clicked on the link. The profile was filled with a series of photos, each featuring different people seemingly caught off guard. Some were on public transportation, others on park benches, and a few even seemed to be in the privacy of their own homes. What made it weird was that none of these people appeared to be aware they were being photographed. As I continued scrolling through the account, expecting to find crude or inappropriate comments, I was met with an odd sight. The comments on the posts were not what I expected. The comments were all just numbers getting gradually higher and higher, stuff like 700, 750, 800, 1000. This was the same under every single post. People writing slightly larger numbers in reply to the last person. The oddest part of all was that every single account that commented appeared to be spam accounts. No profile pictures, no followers, they were just anonymous accounts with no profile set up. I decided to report the account and sent the link to my friend Becky. Still, I didn't give it too much thought and I continued with my day, attending classes and getting lost in assignments. It wasn't until later, after school, that Becky finally replied to my message. Her response was a mix of shock and concern, urging me to report it to the police right away. Her reaction bewildered me, and I questioned why she was so alarmed. Her reply was chilling, why are you not worried about someone posting pictures of you on their Twitter? I quickly returned to the profile, my heart racing. Amongst the unsettling images, I found photos of myself, pictures taken without my knowledge while I walked home from college. I remembered seeing a parked car that day, but I didn't think much of it at the time. My heart sank as I realized that the profile had images of me, just like the others, taken without my consent. The same trend was happening under the pictures of me. Faceless accounts writing numbers, 1300, 1400, 1800. I kept refreshing, watching the number replies come through and that's when it all clicked. 2000, with a dollar sign next to it. My heart dropped and I refreshed again. The tweet was deleted and replaced with just the number 2000. They were bidding. They were offering payment, but for what? Fear gripped me as I comprehended the gravity of the situation. I reported the account to Twitter and contacted the police, providing every detail I could recall. With trembling hands, I locked myself in my room, talking to Becky over the phone, all while being home alone. Hours crawled by, and when I eventually refreshed the Twitter page, I was met with an unsettling message. This page does not exist. My heart pounded in my chest. Becky confirmed the same result. To this day, I don't know if Twitter removed it or if the person behind the account deactivated it. The cryptic numbers in the comments remain a mystery. But one thing's for sure, it felt like a twisted setup and I'm grateful not to know any more about what was happening with that Twitter page. A year ago, I used to post my entire life to Snapchat. It was my go-to app for sharing bits of my life with friends and family. But then something happened that made me reconsider my online presence. One day, out of the blue, I received a friend request from an unfamiliar username. I didn't think much of it at the time and accepted the request without a second thought. It was just another random person, or so I assumed. Months passed, and I forgot about that peculiar friend request. My life went on, and I continued sharing snippets of my daily activities on Snapchat. 
Little did I know that someone was watching, very closely. It started innocently enough, with an unexpected snap. I opened it, thinking it was probably a friend sharing a funny meme or a cute pet photo. But as the image loaded, my heart skipped a beat. It was an eerie, edited version of an old Snapchat story I had posted months ago. Floating love hearts surrounded the image, and the caption read, Can't wait to see you. The chill running down my spine was hard to ignore. How did someone get access to my old stories? Who was behind this? Days turned into weeks, and more edited snaps kept arriving. Each one featured pictures taken from my past stories. The captions became increasingly unsettling, referring to my personal life. How was your McDonald's on Friday? And another said, I love that movie you watched last night. The sense of being watched was inescapable. I felt exposed and vulnerable, as though a stranger had invaded my privacy. It wasn't long before I decided to check Snap Maps, the feature that lets you see the real-time locations of your friends. My heart raced as I zoomed in on the map. There it was, a bit too close for comfort, the location of this creep. He was nearby, and the thought sent shivers down my spine. I couldn't shake the feeling that this was no ordinary prank or trolling. It felt personal, like someone was playing mind games with me. Fear gripped me as I realized the mysterious friend was getting closer to my location. I knew I had to act fast. I began taking screenshots of the disturbing snaps for evidence. Then, I contacted the local authorities and reported the unsettling situation. The investigation that followed uncovered the identity of the creep. To my shock, it turned out to be someone I met at a party months ago, I'd been warned about how creepy and weird he was. He would just invite himself to parties and nobody wanted to be rude and kick him out, so we just tolerated him. To be fair, I had no issue with him and spoke with him a little bit throughout the night, but didn't see much of him. I guess being nice to the social outcast when everyone else kept him at arm's length was enough for him to become obsessed with me. They didn't end up charging him with anything, but they told him to leave me alone and explained to me that I could get a restraining order, but it seemed pointless. High school was typically uneventful until the day Alex showed up. He was a quiet, strange guy, always seen alone in the hallways. At first, there was nothing remarkable about him, but after a few weeks, things began to change. One day, I noticed he was doodling in his notebook during class. It started innocently enough, just random scribbles. But over time, his drawings became disturbing. I started to notice oddly dark tones to his doodles. Twisted faces, distorted creatures, and strange symbols filled the pages. There was one lesson with Alex that changed everything. Tyrone was a typical bully and problem child. He would torment almost everyone equally. Today, Alex was his victim. He grabbed Alex's notebook and started looking through his drawings and loudly mocking him. I don't know what came over me, but I half-jokingly shouted Tyrone's name and said leave him alone. I awkwardly laughed as to not become Tyrone's next target. Suddenly, someone at the front of the class tripped over a box, and Tyrone's attention was completely pulled away from us. You should have seen the look on Alex's face. I don't think I've ever seen him smile until now. He was sat there with his notebook in hand, staring at me with the creepiest grin. He thanked me and muttered something to himself about not having to kill anyone today. It reminded me of Gollum from Lord of the Rings. After that day he was practically my shadow. He'd follow me everywhere. Always standing a few steps away from me. He didn't ever have much to say but he would occasionally make comments about people like Tyrone and we'd all laugh at how dark his humor was. Over time he started sharing his drawings with me. They were all pretty messed up. He even had some detailed drawings of Tyrone being tortured or stabbed. On the odd occasion when he did speak, the things he would say were unsettling, muttering about hidden threats and the consequences that were coming. Looking back, it was so obvious what he was going to do, 
but I kind of convinced myself he just had a dark humor and used his drawings to vent. There were a few notable moments with him over the next few months. He would aggressively defend me in the hallway whenever someone would barge into me. He'd push people out of my way and do these really weird death stares at anyone that would bother me. He was very attached to me and protective. It seemed like as the days went on, he just became more and more angry at the world, muttering more about what he wanted to do to people, telling me that I'm one of the good ones and that he'll never let them hurt me. Towards the end of winter, Alex had a week off school and I started to wonder if he was alright. I'd also noticed at this point that his locker started to smell really bad. I knew his code because I'd seen him put it in so many times and he didn't seem to care that I would watch. I guess curiosity got the better of me and I entered his code and opened his locker door. I can't describe just how powerful the smell was, it didn't just knock me back, it sent me into a coughing fit. It was obvious now why it stank so much. I probably don't need to tell you what I found. A collection of small animals, I remember a cat, a rabbit and some mice. I immediately closed the door again and started to panic. I knew I couldn't just ignore this. I immediately told my teacher about what I'd seen, knowing I might get into trouble for accessing someone else's locker. They ended up closing the whole corridor and getting the police involved. They found multiple hunting knives and all of his disturbing drawings. We never did find out about what happened to him other than the fact that he was kicked out of school and some more security measures were put in place to prevent weapons being brought into school. I don't know what he was planning, or if it was just animals he liked killing, but I feel like if I didn't check his locker, he might have come back and done something seriously bad. I remember the first day when we had this substitute teacher, Mr. Roberts. He had a reputation that spread like wildfire among the students. Everyone said he was weird and would creep everyone out. That day, I was about to find out for myself. Mr. Roberts walked into our classroom and right from the start, something felt off. He had this unnerving way of looking at each one of us as if he was sizing us up. His eyes were piercing like he was trying to see into our souls. As the lesson began, he spoke in a monotone voice that made it hard to stay awake. He covered a subject that should have been interesting but somehow managed to make it utterly boring. I glanced around the room and my classmates had expressions of utter boredom or mild discomfort. What really creeped me out though were his mannerisms. He rarely smiled and when he did it was more of a grimace than anything resembling happiness. His movements were jerky and erratic like he couldn't control his own body. Towards the end of the lesson, some of my classmates decided to test the waters. They asked him personal questions, trying to get to know him better. But his responses were strange. He'd laugh at random moments and make bizarre comments that left us scratching our heads. Then came the incident that really got my guard up. One of my classmates, Alex, asked about his past teaching experiences. Mr. Roberts hesitated for a moment, his eyes darting around the room. Then, in a low, almost whispered voice, he said, I've taught in many places, but they were all temporary. It was as if he was hinting at something darker, something he didn't want us to know. The room fell silent, and everyone felt the awkwardness. We had him twice in the same day, and the afternoon lesson was even more weird than the one in the morning. Mr. Robert's behavior only grew more unsettling. He would suddenly stop talking mid-sentence and stare blankly at the back of the classroom, clearly lost in his thoughts. Then, without warning, he'd snap back to reality and continue as if nothing had happened. When the final bell rang, the whole class breathed a collective sigh of relief. We couldn't get out of that classroom fast enough. As I walked out, I couldn't shake the feeling that Mr. Roberts was hiding something, something that made him more than just a creepy substitute. And I hoped I wouldn't have to see him again anytime soon. Our history teacher disappeared halfway through the year and Mr. Roberts took over our class. We'd see him twice a week. Whenever I was in his classes, I would do my best to just focus on my studies. 
The rest of the school year passed without any serious incidents, just the regular blank staring and growing rumors about how weird he was. Towards the end of the year, after we'd all kind of gotten used to his demeanor, Mr. Roberts crossed a line that couldn't be ignored. During a history lesson, he made a bizarre and inappropriate comment about one of the female students. It was so disturbing that the student immediately reported it to the school authorities. The school administration acted swiftly, launching an investigation into Mr. Roberts' past. It didn't take long for them to uncover a disturbing criminal history. He had been involved in a series of troubling incidents at his previous schools, including allegations of inappropriate behavior and comments. The revelation sent shockwaves through our school, and parents demanded answers. How had the school hired someone with such a dark past? The school board faced intense scrutiny, and many called for a complete overhaul of the hiring process. Mr. Roberts was immediately suspended pending the outcome of the investigation. As more details emerged about his past, it became clear that he should never have been allowed near children. The school took responsibility for its failure to properly vet him and promised to implement stricter hiring practices in the future. While Mr. Roberts was never seen at the school again, the unsettling feeling that had hung over our classroom didn't dissipate easily. The incident served as a chilling reminder of how important it was to remain vigilant and speak up when something didn't seem right. It's weird because people who had his lessons actually improved their grades. He wasn't a bad teacher, just a bad person. After he disappeared there were multiple rumors about him working at another school a few miles away. I always wonder what happened with him. I was a junior in high school when it all started. Mr. Simmons, our English teacher, had always been a bit eccentric, but this year, something changed. He became fixated on me, and it became incredibly uncomfortable. At first, it was harmless. He would compliment my essays or ask me to stay after school to discuss my studies. I didn't think much of it, assuming he was just trying to be a helpful teacher. But soon, it escalated. He started showing up at places he shouldn't have known about, my part-time job at the local bookstore or my favorite coffee shop. Every time, he'd strike up a conversation, making it clear he'd been tracking my activities. It was unnerving, but I hesitated to say anything, fearing it might be a misunderstanding. Then came the gifts, flowers left on my doorstep, anonymous notes in my locker, and even a mixtape of romantic songs. It became impossible to deny that something was terribly wrong. The final straw was when he cornered me after school, professing his love and suggesting we go away together. I knew I couldn't handle this on my own. I confided in my closest friends, who immediately took action. They encouraged me to report Mr. Simmons to the principal. We compiled evidence, texts, notes, and witness accounts of his strange behavior. When we confronted the principal, she was shocked but supportive. She assured us she would investigate the matter thoroughly. What we didn't expect was the revelation that Mr. Simmons had a history of similar obsessions with students at his previous schools. The investigation unveiled a disturbing pattern of predatory behavior. Parents were outraged, and the local news caught wind of the scandal. Eventually, the police got involved, and Mr. Simmons was arrested. Most people were furious about the fact that he'd already been caught doing this in the past. Why was he allowed to teach again? Did the school know about his past, or did they not even check? You'd think we'd have better systems to protect children from predators like this. It all started on a sunny day in college. I had just finished my last class and was excited to get back to my dorm room. Once I arrived back in my dorm, I quickly got on my computer. I was anxious to see what new websites awaited me. A while back, my brother had sort of joined me up to a dark web mailing list where people would send me interesting sites they found. He was a complete computer genius. 
From software and coding to Photoshop and video making, he was a wizard with all of it. One day I received a message from an unknown user. It said, chat to real people from the past. I thought it could be fun, so I clicked on it. The web page loaded, and there was nothing on the screen besides a chat box and a button to search for a new person to talk to. I clicked on the button to find a new person to chat with and it took some time, but eventually I connected with somebody. There was no text or anything. Then, all of a sudden, I received a message. It read, Dear friend, I am writing this internet mail to anyone who cares to read it. I am soon to be a father to twins. I hope this mail reaches you in good condition. We're off to see the new Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back, at the theater to celebrate. New Star Wars. That movie was over 30 years old at this point. This had to be some kind of lame joke, I thought to myself. There was no way a guy in the 1980s was communicating with me. I decided to play along and thought it was all in good fun. Yeah, I wouldn't call that movie new. I watched that when I was a kid. He replied saying, what are you talking about? The opening night is tonight. You must be thinking of a different movie, unless you live abroad and it came out early there. No. I'm a college kid in America, I replied. I went on to list every Star Wars movie and TV show that exists since then. I think you have a very strong imagination, the guy replied. He wrote a long message telling me that they only have plans for a certain amount of movies and that he knows his stuff. He reminded me of my dad. He was a major Star Wars fan. I was fully indulged with the time travel role play and told him that I knew a massive spoiler for The Empire Strikes Back. I was respectful enough to ask him if he wanted to hear it and he confidently replied, challenging me to spoil it for him. If you've seen the movie, you know which one I'm talking about. He laughed and told me that's impossible and mentioned that he was heading off to the theater. He stopped replying at this point, so I assumed that the fun little role play was over. It was quite wholesome and the guy really played the part well, speaking like someone who'd only just figured out what email was and with a polite tone throughout. I went about my day, probably studied a bit less than I should have, and had a small chat with my brother. I told him about the guy from the 80s and he laughed and told me he'll have to check that website out. He was much more nerdy and he was really into all that stuff. He was a bit on the antisocial side so the dark web was his happy place. Hours later, I heard a ding. I'd left the website open without noticing. The 80s guy had actually replied. He was going crazy, asking me how I knew about the big spoiler and speculating that I must have had early access or worked on the film. We had a further back and forth about how I lived in 2023 and I really played into the part about being in the future, teasing him about the technology we have here. Part of me enjoyed the role play, even though that usually wasn't my thing. He asked for my name but I was smart enough not to give someone on the dark web any details about myself. So I asked what he was called and I felt my stomach twist when he told me. Alfie Rogers. This was suddenly not a very fun conversation. That was my dad's name. This person obviously had information on me. They must have pinged my IP address, found out my name, and did some basic background research on Ancestry.com and all those other websites that exist nowadays. Alright, you know my dad's name, this isn't funny. What do you want? I asked him, knowing that this kind of thing usually turns into a blackmail attempt or a twisted game. What do you mean? He replied. Still deep in the role play. There's no way that you just pulled out a random name and it happened to be my dad's name, so you know who I am. What do you want? Even as I called him out, he still didn't budge. He confidently asserted that he was called Alfie Rogers and that he was living in the 1980s. He started to list a bunch of personal details to prove he was a real person. He knew where my dad was born, where his parents came from, my mother's name, her parents, the car he had, everything. It was really disturbing, I'm pretty good with computers so I know just how much information you can get from historical online records, but this was impressively creepy. 
Whoever it was, they were really good at this and they must have planned this for some time. I thought about a question I could ask him, something only my dad could really answer. I found the perfect question. We had an old dog when I was a kid, and unfortunately we had no photos of her. Nobody else would know about this dog, there's absolutely no way it was on any database. So I asked him, who is Poppy? Poppy. That's my dog. How did you know the name of my dog? She's a border collie. She's sat with me right now. That's creepy. How did you do that? I started freaking out. I don't believe in stuff like this. In time travel we're having conversations with the past. But whoever this man was had too much information about my family history. It just didn't make sense. He answered every question I threw at him. I think I spent hours quizzing him on his entire life and eventually accepting that whoever or whatever this person was, I felt like I was talking to my dad when he was my age. I'd settle past the discomfort, enjoying every moment of this conversation. Though I did ask one thing from him. If he really did exist in the past, and he really was my dad, then I wanted him to take some pictures of Poppy. He laughed and told me he'd get right on it. He told me he had to get going, and then he loves how clever computers are. I don't think he fully grasped the situation, but he happily played along as if he was talking to his real son. I asked him to tell Poppy I miss her, and even though I highly suspected that this was some strange AI or a wholesome role player, I told him I loved him. Funnily enough, he replied saying that he loved me, and finished with, can't wait to meet you. Then we ended the conversation. A few weeks passed, I truly felt the happiest that I'd been in a long time. It had been hard living without a dad. He had a heart attack a year before I left for college. But that conversation really gave me a feeling of closure. I felt like I'd navigated my grief and allowed myself to start healing. I'd occasionally check back on that website but never saw anything from him. I suppose it was a one-off thing. Over the next few months I started to think about that conversation less and really started to live my life again. It was Christmas time and I went back home to visit family. It was the second Christmas without him and the lack of his presence was still heavily evident but we enjoyed the holiday and I enjoyed seeing my mom and my brother. On the last night before I returned to college my mom remembered that she had something for me. She brought me an old VHS, it was Star Wars, Empire Strikes Back. I knew what a VHS was, but they'd been extinct for about 20 years, so I wasn't sure why she was giving it to me. Open it, she said. I pried open the clunky case and looked inside. Well shit. There was a whole collection of photos of Poppy, dozens of them. Posing with the whole family, including me and my brother when we were just babies. There were some photos of my dad posing with the dog too, it was surreal, and I was too emotional to think about how these had come to be. There was a note attached. For my brilliant children, may the force be with you. He was always a bit of a dork. My mom said to me, I thought we didn't have any photos of Poppy, I don't even remember your dad taking these. A glimpse of happiness and nostalgia was noticeable in her voice. But your brother found them a few weeks ago. I gave her a big hug and went to find my brother. I told him how great it was that he found them and started to look through them. I told him all about the website and the man from the past who claimed to be my dad and that we even had a conversation about him taking photos of the dog. He was happy to listen and go through the photos with me but he was his usual quiet self and didn't have much to say other than a few positive comments on the photos. He hadn't been the same since he passed. But it was nice to see him with a smile for the first time in a while. So that's my story about my time traveling conversation with my dad. Sometimes it completely freaks me out and I stay up all night thinking about it. Other times, I just feel comfortable knowing that something beyond my comprehension happened to me. Whether it was an incredibly talented hacker or a crazy AI, I don't know. But I tend to avoid the dark web now. I think I got lucky with this encounter. It was only a matter of time before I met someone who would use that information for the wrong reasons.
Okay, so before I start, this was many years ago and I don't do this kind of thing anymore. I was young and naive and I wanted to impress a girl I liked. For legal reasons, this whole story is completely made up. I was in my early 20s and I'd started hanging out with a group of people that party pretty hard. They did all sorts of drugs that I shall not mention here. I did my best to keep away from that stuff, but I may or may not have joined it a few times. My life was a bit of a mess at the time. I won't make too many excuses about why I was hanging out with these people, but one of the reasons I stuck around for so long was this girl. At the time, she was exactly my type. She had long hair and she was playful and flirty, she was pretty much my dream girl. We got chatting and I asked her to hang out some time and she actually agreed. I couldn't believe it. A few days before she was supposed to come and chill, she messaged me asking if I had any of that good green stuff. I didn't smoke on my own, only in social situations that made it a necessity. But instead of saying this, I just lied and said of course I have some. Suddenly, I'm panicking, contacting everyone I know about getting some grass. Nobody could help, and I was desperate. So, I did the dumbest thing I could think of. I went to the dark web. I got myself a virtual private network to stay anonymous and went searching for a way in. After a bit of digging and asking around, I found a link that supposedly led to a dark web marketplace. My heart was pounding as I clicked on that link. The website had a sketchy vibe and it was like nothing I'd ever seen on the regular web. No flashy ads, no social media links, just a simple page with a list of products. I went through the listings until I found what I wanted. I messaged the seller and worked out the details. Paying for it wasn't as easy as clicking one button, like you can on Amazon. They wanted cryptocurrency, so I had to figure out how to get my hands on some. It was a bit of a headache, and cost me $50 for something that should have cost about 20 but I managed to get it sorted. A few days later, a small package arrived. My heart was racing as I opened it. But instead of what I ordered, it was just some random junk. I had been scammed. Panic set in as I realized I was in way over my head. Soon after, I started getting threatening emails from an anonymous sender. They knew what I'd been up to and were demanding more money or they'd expose my activities to the authorities. I was trapped in a twisted game of blackmail. Every knock on my door made me jump. I desperately tried to figure a way out of this mess. I was stuck in a dark wood nightmare of my own making, and I couldn't see a way to escape it. Call me an idiot, because I really am, but I sent the anonymous blackmailers around $600 in total, about $100 every week. They just keep coming back and blackmailing me and I kept paying until eventually I just said screw it and stopped sending them anything. I lived in complete fear for months afterwards, thinking that the FBI were going to break down my door and arrest me. Looking back, it was pretty ridiculous. Nobody cares about a guy buying a tiny amount of green stuff on the internet, but my head wasn't quite right. The worst part is that the girl I liked didn't even care. She came over and we had a great night and she didn't even ask about it. So, if there's a moral to the story, other than avoiding the dark web, I'd say don't do drugs just to impress someone. And don't send $600 to people blackmailing you over a misdemeanor. This is a pretty short story, but it's true, so I'll tell it exactly as it happened. At the time I was a 23-year-old man, I had a history of using the dark web, browsing random sites, ordering some stuff, never really had any issues. I will mention though, that I used literally no programs or filters to protect me. I just went in deep and assumed that my antivirus would protect me from any harm. Ladies, cover your ears for this next part. Unlike other young men, I would watch adult content 
and one night while I was feeling particularly lonely, I found some videos that I wouldn't watch with my parents. I sat in front of my laptop and did my business. Two nights later, I get an email. Weirdly, it said that it was sent by my own email address. I hadn't seen anything like that before. I click on it straight away and I can't describe the feeling that hit me. There was a video attached, and it was me, in my birthday suit, furiously playing rock paper scissors in my lap. You could see everything, including my face at some point in the video when I adjust my seat. So there was no denying who it was. The email listed a bunch of demands, go online and buy some Bitcoin, or gift cards, and send them to him. Or the video of me sending would be sent to my family. The blackmailer had the decency to list the names of my family members, just in case I thought he was bluffing. He gave me a time limit of 48 hours, and pointed out that he could see that I opened the email because he was in my computer, and threatened that if I contact the authorities or start searching about how to deal with this situation, that he would release it all. Call me crazy, but I thought about it for a few hours and decided my dignity was too expensive. I wasn't going to pay someone to hide the fact that I do something that almost every other adult in the world does. I called his bluff and got my friend over to help me clear any viruses from my laptop. He thinks he found how they access my webcam, but we couldn't be sure, so I always have it turned off on the settings, as well as putting a sticker over it. I messaged everyone on the list that he sent me, telling them that they might receive a video of me and explain the situation. They all just laughed and told me I was gross. The blackmail guy never did send the video as far as I know. But I learned my lesson about taking online privacy a bit more seriously. I've been with my wife Rebecca for six years and married for 11 months. Our entire history together has been very normal and never once have I noticed any weird behaviors or red flags. I can't stress enough how out of character this whole thing has been. She doesn't even like watching horror movies. When we first started dating she agreed to watch The Shining with me because she knew how much I loved horror. She was so scared that she didn't even make it through half of the movie before we had to turn it off. She isn't into anything creepy, and has never been into pranks, and that's fine. But that's what was so strange about this. It's just so unlike her. I should also add that she never had any mental health issues, and as far as I'm aware it doesn't run in her family. I know some people are able to hide their mental health problems, but in the six years we've been together I think I have seen some sort of sign. Two months ago, I was in the kitchen making myself some coffee. I was running a bit late that morning and knew I wouldn't be able to grab some food on the way to work. I took a sip of my coffee as I hurried down the hall towards the front door when I happened to notice Rebecca peeking at me from around the corner ahead of me. I could only see her eyes and a strand of her long dark hair hanging against the wall. The rest of her body was concealed behind the corner. I nearly spilled my coffee when I saw her. What the hell, Rebecca? I said wiping a few drops of coffee from my pants. You scared the hell out of me. She immediately popped out of view like a little kid that had been caught. I heard her scurry off towards the living room, and by the time I got to the front door she was out of sight. It was really weird, and just totally out of character for her like I said but I also found it kind of funny that she was being more playful and a little less serious. I shouted that I loved her and called her crazy. As I shut the door behind me, I heard her laughing. Her behavior was a bit odd, but it certainly wasn't something to call a priest over. I forgot about it by lunch and by the time I got home, she was her usual self. I didn't bring it up and life went on. The next incident happened three days later. It was around 2 a.m. and I had woken up to get a drink. I was standing at the kitchen island, glass of orange juice in my hand, when I felt a strong feeling that I was being watched. For whatever reason I looked down at the floor and saw my wife's smiling face staring back. 
She was peeking at me from the other side of the island, staring up at me with wide unblinking eyes, and grinning. Grinning like the Cheshire Cat. I screamed, I'll admit it. Not out of irritation, but fear. For some reason at that moment I was scared. At the sound of my scream she scurried backwards out of my view, her hands and feet smacking the tile floor as she hurried out of the kitchen on all fours. I didn't run after her, or even shout. I just stood there frozen in shock, wondering what the hell had possessed her to do that. It took me a little longer than I'd like to admit to go back upstairs, but I eventually did. When I got to our bedroom, Rebecca was lying on her side asleep. Or at least pretending to. I stood there for a while, watching her breathing, to be sure she really was asleep. I had the feeling she might jump out at me the moment I got into bed. I climbed in, and she didn't even move. Her breathing was soft and I was starting to wonder if I drank the whole thing. The next morning I waited for her to come down for coffee and after handing her a mug and kissing her cheek I decided to ask her about it. What was that about last night? I was keeping my tone light so I didn't offend or embarrass her. She frowned over her cup of coffee, shaking her head like she had no clue what I was referring to. You were peeking at me again. From over there. I said, pointing to the spot on the floor by the kitchen island. She followed my gaze, and when she looked back at me she burst out laughing. She laughed so hard that I couldn't help joining in. You creep me out sometimes, you know that? She laughed at what I had said and wrapped her arms around my neck. You creep me out all the time, so I guess we're even. We said our goodbyes and left for work. As I drove I kept thinking about how creepy it had been seeing her grinning at me from behind the island like that. The sounds her hands made on the floor as she crawled away. I told myself she was just trying to be silly. Just trying to join me in my love of all things horror. It's not like I was afraid of her, but it still didn't sit right. I started seeing her peeking at me more and more. Sometimes she'd be peeking out from behind the couch or living room curtains. Once she even managed to get inside her grandmother's old trunk that sits at the foot of her bed. I might not have even known she was there if the trunk's old hinges had not given her away. She had the lid propped up just enough so that only half of her face peeked out. She'd been grinning like an excited toddler. It was unnerving. I didn't even know what to say to her. All I could do was stare. When I finally found my voice, I asked her why on earth was she doing this. She didn't answer, but she had slowly closed the lid, shutting herself inside the trunk. I just walked away feeling disturbed. I didn't understand why she was doing it, but it clearly made her happy. I just hoped she would tire of the game quickly. Rebecca didn't peek at me for the next two weeks. I started to think she was done with her weird prank and I was relieved. We were watching a show on Netflix one night and I jokingly said that I hadn't seen her peeking at me lately and that she must have given up on her game. She looked up at me with a small smile and said, maybe I've just gotten better at it. I didn't say anything but I wondered whether or not she was joking. For the next few days I couldn't stop thinking about what she'd said. Was she still peeking at me when I wasn't looking and I just hadn't noticed? And if so, what the hell was she getting out of this? I started to feel paranoid, constantly checking whether she was watching from around the corner or behind a door. I was jumpy whenever I was home and she wasn't in full view of me. I felt stupid and a little crazy. But after a few weeks without another incident, I began to relax. I stopped checking behind furniture and walls and told myself it was just a bad memory. Then a few days ago things got so much worse. Rebecca left to go to a friend's and I lounged on the couch and played a couple games on my laptop. 
Around 9 p.m. I hopped in the shower and as I was washing the soap from my hair, I felt that awful feeling that I was being watched. I slowly opened my eyes and almost had a heart attack. Rebecca was peeking from behind the shower curtain, her entire head stretched into the shower, leaving just her body outside. Her long dark hair hung against the curtain, the ends dripping with water. Her mouth hung open in a terrible grin, eyes wide open and red, as if she hadn't blinked in a while. I screamed and jumped back against the wall. She didn't move, nor did her smile waver. Her makeup ran down her cheeks in two black streaks. She looked giddy and completely deranged. I was terrified. We stood like that for a few moments, neither of us saying a word. Finally, after what felt like forever, she slowly pulled her head back out of the shower, and I watched her blurry figure through the curtain as she moved backwards towards the bathroom door. A second later the bathroom door slammed shut, hard enough to rattle the mirror. I screamed again, and jumped out of the shower to lock the door. I stayed inside the bathroom for over an hour. Maybe I overreacted, but joke or not, I wasn't going to put up with the craziness anymore. That's what I kept telling myself as I paced in my bathroom, stopping to listen at the door every few minutes. Suddenly I heard a muffled sound, and I pressed my ear against the bathroom door, straining to listen. I couldn't hear anything, but I envisioned Rebecca standing on the other side of the door, giggling at her joke. I felt a surge of anger. I was beyond annoyed at being made to feel scared in my own house and having to hide in the bathroom for an hour. All for what? If it was a joke, it was an awful one. What the hell, Rebecca? I snapped. This is getting really annoying. I waited for her to apologize or to call me a jerk. But instead, I heard a faint moan. So quiet, I wondered if I heard it at all and then complete silence. Rebecca? I called out, not able to even hide the shakiness in my voice. I got no response. Just my own heavy breathing. I swear to God, just stop it. I yelled at her, pounding my fist on the door. I waited for her to cuss me out, something I would expect from me talking to her like that. I never screamed at her before, but there was nothing, just the occasional drip from the shower head. I won't deny that I was scared, too afraid to open the damn door and face my own life. I waited another 30 minutes or so, which feels like a lifetime when you're scared. Finally, I decided I wasn't going to spend the night hiding in my bathroom, so I got down on my knees and peered under the door. I almost expected to see her face peeking back at me, but thankfully she was gone. I could see straight down the hallway to the top of the stairs, but no Rebecca. I didn't know if I should be happy about that or not. I looked for a few minutes, waiting to see her head pop up over the top step, but it never came. I stood up, my hand hovering over the door and prepared myself to open it. I slowly turned the lock with shaky fingers and was about to yank it open when I heard a sound that still makes me feel nauseous when I think about it. A moan. Louder than before. But this time I was able to tell just where it was coming from. I turned my head to the closet door as if in slow motion and locked eyes with my wife who was peeking out at me from the slight gap. Her eyes were still wide as ever and her mouth was hanging open in the most grotesque gaping smile. I didn't even scream. I was too scared for even that. Her hands were clasped to her chest, body trembling with sheer delight, as if she could barely contain her excitement. A short raspy moan bubbled up from her throat, deep and raw, sending a shiver through my entire body. Somehow I found the ability to pull the bathroom door open and ran as fast as I could all the way down the steps, snagging my keys and phone from the table in the living room before running outside to my car. I could hear her shrill laughter behind me, but I didn't hear her getting closer. 
I didn't bother shutting the front door. I drove away from the house faster than I legally should have, shivering the entire time either from fear or the cold. Maybe a little of both. I hadn't grabbed a coat or even a pair of shoes. I was still in my boxers and my hair was still damp. I drove straight to my brother Chris's house about 40 minutes away, ignoring any and every call and text I got. I didn't check my phone until I was safely parked in my brother's driveway. Rebecca had called four times and sent a flurry of texts, all wondering where I'd gone and why I left like that. I threw my phone at the dash. I was furious at her nonchalant attitude. My brother and his wife were surprised to see me show up, especially dressed in just a pair of boxers, but told me to stay as long as I needed. Chris lent me some clothes and asked me what happened. I told him we had a fight, but didn't get into the details. I didn't want him to think I was overreacting, leaving my wife over a prank, even if it was a strange one. I mean, Hadn't I encouraged her for years to lighten up instead of being so serious all the time? I had wanted her to relax and loosen up, but this was definitely not what I had in mind. I tried to sleep on their sofa, but my brain wouldn't let me sleep. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw Rebecca's face staring at me from inside the closet. Knowing she'd been in there with me the entire time made my skin crawl. She never left the bathroom at all. Instead, she slipped inside the closet and slammed the bathroom door shut to fool me. The mere thought of going back home gave me anxiety. I tossed and turned, unable to sleep. Chris ended up giving me a sleeping pill so I was able to get a little rest. My sleep was filled with terrible dreams, all of which were Rebecca's smiling face. I woke up just as the sun started to rise. My whole body ached and I felt drained. I knew I'd have to call her at some point, but I didn't know what to say to her. I wouldn't be going home unless she gave me her word she'd never do any more creepy stuff. I just wanted my wife back. Her normal serious self never looked so good to me. I was contemplating calling her and telling her when that familiar feeling came back. I was being watched. I was staring at the ceiling, my heart in my throat. I didn't want to look away, but the longer I ignored the feeling, the worse it got. My eyes drifted away from the ceiling almost on their own. Her face was pressed up against the window beside the couch, staring down at me with that same gaping smile. Drool dribbled down her lips, leaving two long streaks down the glass. I didn't know how long she'd been there, but something told me she'd been there quite a while, possibly all night. I didn't bother screaming, but I was afraid anger trumped any fear I felt at that moment. I jumped up from the couch and pounded my palm against the glass. Rebecca, are you crazy? What the hell is wrong with you? Just go home. Now, she didn't move and her ghastly expression never changed. If anything, her smile only grew as if she had never been more elated. I could hear Chris and his wife moving around upstairs. As if Rebecca could hear them from her place outside, her head twitched slightly in their direction and she began to close her mouth slowly. Chris called my name from upstairs, obviously concerned. I turned around to see him running down the stairs. When I turned back to the window, Rebecca had disappeared. The only sign she'd been there at all was the two streaks of drool still dripping down the glass. I tried explaining to Chris and Jess about waking up to see Rebecca watching me through their window. They were skeptical. We went outside to the spot in front of the window, but there were no footprints in the dirt, just a slight indent. Animal probably, Chris guessed, and I didn't argue. He and Jess assumed I dreamt the entire episode, but they didn't understand, and I was too tired to explain it to them. I called out of work that day and turned my phone off. 
I didn't want to face Rebecca. Just talking to her was too much for me at that point. I really started to believe something was irreversibly wrong with her. That no matter what promises she made we'd never be the same again. The thought saddened me to my core. I cried most of the morning. By noon I figured I was ready to confront her. Give her one last chance to explain herself. I could at least give her that after six years I told myself. I turned my phone on and saw the dozens of texts she'd sent, all from a seemingly concerned wife. Can we talk? I love you. Please call me. I'm really worried. Can you answer? Just come home. And more of the same. All texts telling me she loved me and she wanted me home. How worried she was. Not a damn one addressing the crazy crap she pulled. Like she hadn't been acting like a character from a Stephen King book. Even her texts were different. She normally texted novels just to tell me to pick up a loaf of bread. You'd think she'd have more to say to me after her bizarre shenanigans. I know it probably seems childish to some of you who are miles away from this situation. But if you saw the way Rebecca had looked at me, how she scampered away on all fours like some wild animal, grinning at me from inside the closet like a lunatic, then I think you'd find my reaction was warranted. I ended up staying with them for another night. I didn't wake up yesterday until afternoon, and thankfully I didn't see Rebecca's face watching me through the window. I don't want to pry, because it's not my place. But is this fight something that can be mended? Jess was asking me about the situation. She made us both a sandwich for lunch and I knew she wanted to breach the subject without seeming to be nosy. I don't know, she's like a different person. I chose my words carefully. I still wasn't ready for her or my brother to know the full extent of the craziness I had been dealing with. People change, but she's still the same woman you married. Maybe you both just need to talk through your issues. Whatever's going on, I'm sure it can be fixed. I think it's beyond that now. I don't think talking would help. I just don't trust her. The words stung in my heart. I missed and loved my wife. But how could I live with someone like that? Living in constant fear didn't sound too appealing. Rebecca loves you. She has to be absolutely crushed. I don't know about that. Well, she certainly seemed like it. I've never seen her so upset. It took a full minute for me to realize what she just said. And when I did, I felt dread rush over my body. Wait, what do you mean? You saw her? You saw Rebecca? I asked with my mouth suddenly feeling very dry. Jess nodded casually as if that fact was a nightmare fuel. Maybe for her it wasn't, but for me it was. She stopped by this morning just after Chris left for work. I didn't see her car though. Maybe she took an Uber or something. What did she say? Did, did she come inside? Sweat started to break out on my forehead. I began looking around, examining corners as though a predator lurked behind them. No, she just asked if you were awake yet and I said that you weren't. I asked if she wanted me to wake you but she said no. Just said to let you sleep. That's all, she didn't say anything else? No, she looked awful though. Like she hadn't slept in days. I think you should call her. I got from the table and thanked Jess for lunch. I felt a little bit better at the knowledge that at least she hadn't come inside. Still, I needed to double check that the doors were locked. I sat for a while trying to figure out what to do next. I didn't want to go home, but I felt that I owed it to Rebecca to help her if I could. Hadn't I swore an oath to love and honor her through sickness and in health? Clearly she was very sick. If she was sick, 
which I truly believed she was, I had to try and get her the help she needed. But I didn't even know where to start. I didn't want to call the police, and besides, what the hell was I going to tell them? That my wife was peeking at me? That she was being creepy? As bizarre as she'd been, she still hadn't committed any crime. Not yet anyway. The police would have probably said that I was overreacting. But this wasn't some prank. It felt wrong. Dangerous. Like something sinister lurked beneath her smile. I knew as her husband I was well within my rights to have her committed, but what if she simply acted normal in their presence? She obviously been able to fool Jess into thinking she was just a concerned wife. As long as the doctors didn't find her a danger to herself or others, they'd have no choice but to release her after 72 hours. I felt lost and overwhelmed. So I did what any husband in my position would do. I called her mother. I didn't want to, believe me. We were never on the best of terms. We never fought or anything like that. She just wasn't a very warm person and wasn't very easy to get along with. She hardly ever smiled and when she did, only her lips would move into a thin-lipped smile, leaving her eyes as blank as before. She gave off this aura that felt like she was permanently on the offensive. I'd only met her twice and both times were very short. I got the impression she didn't approve of me for her daughter. Rebecca always ushered us out quickly, as she didn't want me to feel uncomfortable which I was grateful for. Being in her mother's company felt almost unbearable. Like walking on glass. I was glad when we moved three states away so we didn't have to see her often. I was happy to avoid the woman, but I needed her help. I really didn't want to talk to her, but I had to talk to someone. She was the only person who might know Rebecca better than me. I took a deep breath and picked up the phone. Yes, she answered, already sounding irritated. Marianne, it's me, Ben. Do you have a minute to talk? I could hear her cluck her tongue in irritation. I'm in the middle of writing some checks, but if you insist, I suppose I can spare a moment. What is it that you want to discuss? It's about Rebecca. She's been acting strange. And I was wondering if you had any idea whether there was something she interrupted me abruptly. It's a bit difficult to follow your rambling Benjamin. What is that you want from me? I could almost see her standing there in her thin sweater and slacks, tapping her fingernails impatiently on the table. I wanted to know if you ever noticed any odd behavior or possibly any mental health issues. There was a long, uncomfortable pause, maybe because she was just thinking or something else. Finally, after a few seconds, she spoke. I'm not sure if this is one of your jokes, Benjamin, but if so, I don't find it very funny. Now I do have business to attend to, as I said, so if you don't mind, I cut her off before she could get rid of me. Marianne, it's not a joke. I'm sincerely concerned about Rebecca's mental health. Her behavior has been very erratic lately. I'm very worried about her and I figured as her mother you would be as well. The frustration was evident in my voice. If you're truly concerned then I suggest you get the health professionals involved. I don't know what you expect of me. She snapped. I could tell she was seconds away from hanging up and for some reason I was desperate not to let her. I had the feeling that she knew a lot more than she was letting on. Please. If not for me, do it for Rebecca. I heard a faint shaky intake of breath as if she were trying to hold her steely persona together but failing. Marianne? Benjamin, I don't know what to tell you. My only advice would be to seek professional help. Do not call here again. I tried to call out to her, but she hung up. 
I tried to wrap my head around the call and her refusal to help me. Even if she didn't like me, why wouldn't she want to help her own daughter? I couldn't understand that. I tried to replay the conversation, desperate to find something I missed. I almost gave up until I remembered her last words to me. Seek professional help, she'd said those words with a bit of urgency. I could have just been grasping at straws, but no, I was sure her voice had changed ever so slightly when she'd said that. As if those words were very important. What had she meant? I assumed she'd been referring to medical professionals, but maybe she was referring to someone else. Someone that for some reason, she didn't feel comfortable saying directly. Or maybe I was just desperate. I waited for Chris to get home after a very long and exhausting conversation. I convinced them that Rebecca truly needed psychiatric help. I didn't tell them everything. I wasn't prepared to go into it yet, but I told them about our last encounter. How she hidden in the bathroom, peeking at me from the closet. They were obviously shocked, but thankfully they believed me. They too just wanted to help her. Still, they didn't think it was all that serious. Weird, maybe, but not dangerous. They just kept saying that Rebecca had to be playing some kind of weird joke. Maybe for YouTube? Jess offered, if only half-heartedly. Chris didn't think we should involve the police just yet. He offered instead to go with me, and I readily accepted. He reasoned that calmly talking to her, trying to coax her into going willingly was the best recourse. I agreed to do it his way. At least I wouldn't be going into that house alone. We drove over this morning, just after breakfast. There was no way I was going at night. When we pulled into the driveway, my stomach began doing somersaults. Her car wasn't there, but I still didn't let my guard down. The front door was ajar, and for a split second I thought we'd see her eyes staring through the gap. I was shaking and starting to sweat. Chris, however, was fine. He waited for me to open the door, his hands in his pockets like he was going on a stroll through the park. I envied his ignorance. I pushed the door open and was immediately hit with the stench of rot. Chris smelled it too, and he walked in the house behind me with his nose scrunched up. My eyes were looking around for any signs of Rebecca. The house was deadly quiet and dark, despite being late in the morning. All the curtains were closed up tight, refusing to allow any sunlight inside. If I hadn't left just two days ago, I'd have thought the house to be abandoned. We moved through each room, carefully checking any place that she might hide, occasionally calling her name. Why the hell are you looking under the couch? Are we looking for your wife? He was looking at me like I was a moron. Let's just go upstairs. He shook his head but followed me up the stairs to check the bathroom and spare bedroom. On the way up, my shoes crunched over pieces of glass that looked to be littered over a few of the steps. I noticed that one of our wedding portraits that hung on the wall along the staircase had been smashed. The frame hung crookedly, all the glass was removed. I stared at the picture, a lump forming in my throat. We had taken the photo just after leaving the church. She looked so beautiful in her white gown. I looked at her beautiful face. I never dreamed her face would ever be a source of terror for me. We climbed the rest of the steps and checked the spare bedroom, but it looked completely untouched. I was hesitant to go into the bathroom, my fear from that night coming back to me all at once. Chris noticed and offered to go in by himself, but I couldn't let him do that. So we walked in together, checking the closet and the shower. The bathroom looked as if it hadn't been touched since the night I left. I don't think she's here. Why don't you pack some clothes and we'll try coming back tomorrow or something? I nodded and went into our bedroom and shut some clothes into a duffel bag. 
When I checked inside her closet, I found the source of the smell. I immediately started gagging. Chris took one look and lost all color in his face. He had to go stand by the stairs to get away from the sight and smell. I gazed down in shock at what lay inside my bedroom closet. Soaking into the rug were at least a dozen eyeballs, all carefully laid out in pairs. Some were as large as a coin, while others were as tiny as a marble. I stared down at the eyes she collected from small animals and I wondered how she'd gotten them. I shuddered at the thought. Man, I thought I had it bad with my wife's shoe addiction. Yours is in here collecting eyeballs. Chris said while gagging. Ben, I think we should go. He called from the hall. I'm getting nauseous. I grabbed my duffel and shut the closet door. I stepped out into the hall and took a deep breath of air. I could taste the rotten smell on my tongue and I couldn't help but gag. Who the hell lines up eyeballs in their closet like that? I tried to tell you she needed help. She doesn't need help, Ben. She needs an exorcist. You coming or what? I can't stand the smell anymore. His words died in his throat and his eyes grew wide with fear. I didn't ask him why. I could feel it. Someone was watching me and I didn't think it was the eyes in the closet. I turned around, my eyes slowly scanning the bedroom. Christ, I whispered as I finally saw what we'd missed. Under the bed, curled on her side, watching us with the excitement of a kid on Christmas morning, was my wife. She held her hands together just under her chin and they were shaking eagerly. Now that she knew she'd been found, I could hear the quiet noises she was making. A sort of hiccuping sound in her throat, as if the excitement was just too much for her. It was unnerving to say the least. Wide eyes, and that same huge smile. Everything in me told me to run, but I forced it away. This was my wife. No matter how twisted, she was still the woman I married. I had to help her. Rebecca, I said softly. She didn't respond, but her head bobbed back and forth in two quick little movements as if she were nodding. Baby, I just want to help, okay? Can you? Can you let me do that? I had taken a single step forward, approaching her like some kind of dangerous animal. I love you. Rebecca, I said softly, taking another step closer. She let a tiny moan escape her wide open mouth and I had to resist the urge to run. Her shoulders were starting to quiver and her eyes grew as large as saucers. I crouched down so I could see her better and immediately saw the blood. Her hands were covered in it. They trembled more the closer I got, as if she was barely able to contain herself. Rebecca, are you hurt? You're bleeding. She bobbed her head again, her bloody fingers moving up and down as if playing an invisible piano. They occasionally grazed her chin, leaving smears of blood on her skin. I wanted to recoil in disgust. The smell that was coming off of her was revolting. I could feel the vomit trying to climb up my throat. Her lips were dry and stretched thin, blood seeping between the cracks. I knew she wouldn't come on her own, but I didn't want to leave her in the state she was in. I scooted closer and reached out to her. The excited hiccuping sounds got louder and her hands shook, fingers flexing. It was then that I could see the blood oozing from in between her fingers. Oh my god, you're bleeding. Instinctively I reached out to take her hand, but before I could even touch her, her hand sprang out towards me. A sharp pain shot through my arm and I fell back on my ass. My arm burned and I could see the blood dripping down onto the carpet. I looked back at her in shock and saw her grinning madly, her fingers clutching a large shard of glass. You alright in there? Chris asked from behind me. 
I turned my head slightly and nodded to him, cradling my entourage.